So I also, like Bo, work for Campus Outreach, and I spend a lot of time at West Georgia, so I'm not across the world, I'm on Maple Street, and uh, I spend a lot of time in dugouts and locker rooms and ball fields. Primarily what I do is I make disciples in the athletic department, so I remember meeting Bo as a you know, young stud, tight end. I also spend a lot of time with the baseball field, and I remember one story in particular. There was a young guy in our infield uh, who was pretty jacked up. I mean, this guy like lived in the weight room but he also had some anger problems. I mean, this guy was like a barroom brawler. He would start a fight anytime, any place, anywhere. You know, potentially there was some roid rage involved. But this was a guy who like went into every game and like just, just looking to like crush the opponent. So I remember one uh, midweek game, this is years ago, we're up in Dahlonega. We're playing North Georgia and things were getting a little chippy. There, there was some trash talk, you know, some chatter going from one dugout to the next. Pitchers are blowing back, you know, hitters. And, I, and I'm just sitting there in the dugout. I'm like, it's only a matter of time. It's not if, it's when. There's going to be a fight. And I know this one guy in particular, like, he's going to lead the charge. And he's going to come out throwing haymakers. Well, it, it, as it all came together, this guy actually in the middle of the game had to go to the bathroom. Okay, so he's sitting in the bathroom doing what people do while they sit on the toilet and the West Georgia batter is at the home plate, and the pitcher just beams him. I mean, just hits him with a fastball right in the side, and immediately there's a bench-clearing brawl. And I'm sort of jogging out there. I'm like, no, guys, don't fight. You know, trying to hold back the West Georgia guys, doing whatever I can just to not take an uppercut to the jaw. And it's a baseball fight, you know, so there's a couple guys, you know, with some headlocks. Some guys are just throwing fists, but most guys are just like taunting, pointing fingers, and not really doing anything about it. And so the fight starts and finishes in about 90 seconds. That's it. And by the time we're all going back to the dugout, this guy comes out of the toilet, and he's like, guys, what did I miss? <laughs> okay, guys, this is a decent analogy, not a great analogy to kick off a sermon, but, but here's the point of the story. We have a guy who was eager to fight, who, who wanted to battle, and yet he was so fixated on handling his personal business that he did not realize there was a battle going on around him. You with me? Okay. There was a war going on around him, and he totally missed out on it. And so we've been doing, doing a series for the last couple of weeks about spiritual warfare. And the point is this. Okay. You might be thinking to yourself, well, Ben, this is like peacetime. We're Americans. It's the 21st century. There's no battles. Things are smooth. I'm middle class. Everything's okay. It's chill. It's chill. I'm coasting through life. Well, what Paul would say, he would say, whether you realize it or not, you're in a war. You and I are in a war. And if we're in a war, there's a couple of truths that we need to reckon with. First is this, is you have an enemy. The enemy is described in Ephesians 6 as the evil one. In other places in Scripture, he's described as the devil, the Satan. Christ himself describes Satan as this, as, as somebody who wants to steal, kill, and destroy you. So not only do we have an enemy, there's also a battlefield. Anytime there's a war, there's a battlefield. Think about this. There's no neutral ground in this spiritual war. Because God made everything, the heavens and the earth, and therefore Satan is contesting every inch of God's creation. Jesus said this in the Lord's Prayer. This was his prayer. On earth as it, as it is in what? In heaven. And so conversely, it's not necessarily Satan's prayer, but it's his desire that on earth as it is in hell, every inch of creation is being contested. And here's what Paul says about this battle. This isn't like drone warfare. There's no sniper rifles. Verse 12, he says, we fight up close and personal. He says, this is hand-to-hand -hand combat because we're wrestling with the evil forces. That means that evil is getting up in your grill. Four times in this passage, Paul says to believers, I want you to stand firm, to be resolute, to dig your heels in, to be stable, to be firm in crisis. Now remember, Paul's talking to the church. Paul's communicating to believers. And he reminds us that we need to put on the armor of God. He says you've got to put it on. So we've talked about the belt of truth. We've talked about the breastplate of righteousness. Last week, we talked about the gospel shoes. And if you missed it, here's essentially what Paul is saying. He's saying these are all gospel truths, that we've been justified, that we are righteous, that we have a relationship with the truth, 
Jesus Christ. And what Paul is saying is he's saying, take the truth of the gospel and you got to wear it. You got to feel it. You got to use it. You got to take these truths and you got to drill it into the very center of your heart. And once you do that, you'll be ready to fight. But here's what's interesting. Until this point, as Paul talks about the breastplate, the belt, and the shoes, those are all items that you wear at all times. If you're a soldier, you wear them every time you step into battle. Today, we're going to talk about the shield of faith. And this is actually a situational item. You don't use it always. There are particular circumstances and situations where we just need extra protection, where we actually need to take up a shield. And so that's what we're going to discuss this morning. When and how do I take up the shield? So if you could read with me, we're going to be in Ephesians 6, 10 through 20. It says this, finally, be strong in the Lord. And in the strength of his might, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers and authorities and cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened the belt of truth, Put on the breast of right, breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. This is our verse for this morning, verse 16. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, that words may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to boldly proclaim the, the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. So here's where we're headed this morning. First off, we're going to talk about what is the shield. What is the shield of faith? Now, more than likely, because we've all been influenced by Hollywood, When you hear that phrase, shield, whatever comes to mind, okay, is a certain movie that you watched, you know, in your generation. So if you're maybe like an old head in the room, you're thinking about Kirk Douglas and Spartacus, probably, you know, if you're middle-aged like me, let's go to the next slide, you're maybe, you're thinking about William Wallace and Braveheart or Maximus, Decimus, Aurelius, we've got Russell Crowe, you know, in Gladiator. And you young guys, like, y'all don't even watch, like, wartime epics anymore. You're probably thinking about Captain America, a red, white, and blue shield. But here's what you got to understand. Paul is envisioning a Roman soldier. And this isn't a small, round shield. This is actually the shield that you can see on your right. In the original language, it was called a scutum. And basically, it was about five feet tall, and it was about three feet wide. It was huge. It was long. It was wide. And this word was the same word that they would use for a door because it was designed to cover the entire person. Now, I mentioned this earlier. Every other part of the armor we wear at all times, but Paul instructs us to take this up. And believe it or not, Roman soldiers would only use this shield in one critical moment in every battle. Because think about it. It's very heavy. It's very cumbersome. You couldn't march with it. Okay? It, would, it would slow you down. And when you finally conquered a city or you've taken a castle, you wouldn't use a sword because you'd just be putting people to death. So there's this one critical moment in every battle when you would actually take up or pick up your shield. And it's when you could put your hand at the wall. It's the moment of breakthrough. This was the most critical moment, but also the most dangerous moment in every battle. Because if you could put your hand at the wall, guess what? The enemy is looking down on you, They know you're about to sack their city. They're desperate, and they're going to throw everything they got at you. Okay, they're throwing weights. They're dumping fire. They're giving you everything they got. In this moment, Paul says what? You've got to take up your shield. You've got to pick up your door. You've got to hold on. You've got to grip it, because in this moment, you need extra cover. You need additional protection. Now, here's what's really interesting. If you were part of the original church in Ephesus, this would have made perfect sense. Because all throughout the Old Testament, 
God actually uses this metaphor, this symbol as a shield to describe himself and the care that he gives to those who follow him. Let's look at a couple verses right here. This is what Paul says, or excuse me, what God says to King Solomon. He says, every word of God is tested. He's a shield to those who take refuge in him. In Psalm 28, this is the warrior, the soldier David, recounting the character of God. He says what? The Lord is my strength. The Lord is my shield. My heart trusts him and I'm helped. And then finally, God himself reveals himself to Abraham as what? He calls Abraham to do something audacious and bold and ambitious, to leave the comfort of his home. And God says what to Abraham? I'm your shield. I'm your, and your reward shall be very great. And so this is literally what we're doing. We are joining the saints of old, Solomon and David and Abraham. When we say, God is my shield, we say, I'm going to hold on to the promises of God. I'm going to grip onto the power of God. He is my cover. He is my protection. So what do we need protection from? What are we being covered from? Well, we're being covered or protected from the darts of the enemy. So what are the darts? Well, the darts are literally arrows, but not just ordinary arrows. Because here's what the enemy would do. They would take the arrow, and they would dip it in this flammable substance. They called it pitch, and they would light it on fire. So just think about it, if somebody's shooting a flaming arrow at you, it's not only going to hit you, but that material is going to bounce off you, it's going to splatter, and it's going to land on other people's shields and clothes, and it's going to start more fires. Now here's what you got to understand about the flaming arrow. Okay, this was very strategic, because it was scary. It was designed to induce alarm so that when you would get to the wall and people start, you know, and, and you start seeing the flames around you, you're going to run, you're going to retreat, you're going to get scurred and just take off, okay? So it's one thing to see like some, another soldier, you know, that you're locking arms with, like go down because of an arrow, but to see somebody consumed by flames, that's terrifying. And in this passage, Paul likens fiery darts to the schemes of the evil one. Now here's what you got to remember. Okay, the devil doesn't fight fair and he doesn't use traditional weapons. Satan doesn't drop literal bombs. He doesn't use tanks or planes. The only weapon that Satan uses are lies. And so when he's shooting or flinging darts at you, he's sending lies in your direction. And so sometimes Satan will lie about you. So if you ever feel like false guilt and condemnation, you're receiving accusations, those are the darts of the enemy. Sometimes the evil one will lie about God. Do you ever experience worry or anxiety or just wonder, can I really trust God? Satan is throwing darts at the very character of God. But there's also darts in the world, these places that we're tempted, where, where we want to give in to our lust or our greed Satan uses idols and temptations to lie to us. And so here's what's really interesting. See, once again, we've been heavily influenced by Hollywood. So if I said, have you ever experienced spiritual warfare? There might be some crazy scene that comes to mind, like a Catholic priest, you know, um, you know with a crucifix, like some sort of you know, dramatic deliverance moment. But, but I, I recently came across this story. This is pretty funny. Um, there, there was a lady, somebody was telling me about um, being at line in a cookout, okay? Cookout, like best deal in town, right? And uh, he's standing behind this lady, and she ordered her tray, you know, probably her like Reese's, you know, milkshake, whatever your favorite milkshake is, that's what she got. Okay, but, the, you know, the little teenager uh, cashier looks at her and says, ma'am, your entire meal will be $6.66. And she said, not today, Satan, I'll take a corn dog as well, Okay. <laughs> So, you know, we, we, we tend to think that oftentimes if I'm going to engage in spiritual warfare, it's this dramatic, you know, moment with the priest. Maybe I'm using a crucifix. In this story, this lady was using a corn dog. But here's what I want you to see, okay? Real spiritual warfare, it happens in our hearts and our minds each and every day. Because we're battling against the lies of Satan and we're fighting back with truth. This is what spiritual warfare actually is. But here's what we're going to hone in on this morning. We're going to talk about suffering and trials. Because we've talked a lot about how the enemy comes at us and tries to tempt us 
and we respond with truth. This morning, we're going to talk in particular about going through suffering and adversity. Because once again, all throughout Scripture, you will see that adversity is compared to fiery trials. Let me give you a few examples. Isaiah 43 says this, When you walk through the fire, you won't be burned, and the flames won't consume you. If you flip to the end of your Bible in Revelations 3, the author compares the church or the believers to gold being refined by fire. Okay? The, uh, Peter in 1 Peter 4 says this to his church. He says, beloved. He's talking to believers once again. He says, don't be surprised by the fiery trial, as if something strange was coming about you. So oftentimes, the, the, the way that we experience the fiery darts of the enemy, it's in our moments of suffering. And this is when Paul commands us to stand firm, to be resolute, okay, and, and, and to make a stand. I'll give you a quick story of a pastor who held on to the shield of faith. He was a pastor in London, England during World War II, and he was the pastor of Westminster Abbey. His name was Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. And believe it or not, he was actually holding church. He was having a Sunday service during uh, the Battle of Britain. And while he was actually delivering his pastoral prayer, the congregation and Dr. Jones himself heard a German bomb descending. So they could hear the noise. It got louder and louder, closer and closer, and there was this, you know, just incredible boom. It was deafening. It was a shattering sound. The crap, the the chapel started cracking. The foundations were, were shaking. The ceiling tiles were falling. Many people in the church actually jumped up out of their seats to take off running from the chapel. But what did Dr. Martin Lowe Jones do? He took a brief pause, he collected his thoughts, and then he kept on praying. He kept on praying. This man held on to a shield. And to make the story even better, there was actually a British officer in the audience. This man had seen, seen heroism, he'd seen valor, and he said this, I've seen many things in the trenches of France. But I've never seen anything more remarkable than the way that that man went on with his prayer as though nothing happened. Don't you want to stand firm like that? Don't you want to hold the shield? So how do we take it up? This is what we'll talk about now. How do we take up this shield? Now, now if you're anything like me, if you want to take up a new hobby, take up a new craft, where's the first place you go? YouTube.com, right? So you want to take up a golf club, I want to learn how to hold the club, swing the club. I got some YouTube tutorials. My wife is an artist. She wants to learn how to watercolor. She wants to take up the paintbrush. She hops on YouTube. Unfortunately, did a little research. No YouTube tutorials on how to hold a shield, okay? They don't exist. So let's break it down because this is a mental exercise. This is something we do internally in our minds and hearts. We fight the lies with the truth. That's how we hold up the shield. So number one, we got to believe that God is better. God is better. Turn to your neighbor and say, God is better. So God is better than sin. God is better than sin. See, every time we sin and disobey God, we're actually believing the lies of the evil one. When we disobey God and break his commands, with our actions we're saying, God doesn't know what's best. The evil one knows what's best. Think of the daily ways that you're tempted So maybe you're tempted when it comes to your sexual purity. You're tempted to access pornography. The question is, who are you going to believe? That God has a better vision for sexuality or the evil one? Maybe you're tempted in the realm of of how you spend your money. And so you you get a little extra income. And in that moment, the question is, you know, whose vision for your finances do you believe? Do you believe it's best to be generous or to spend that money for yourself and buy a new pair of shoes? Maybe it comes to your free time, and and it's before work, and the alarm's going off. In that moment, you got to decide, do I trust that God's way is best, and that I need to spend time reading my Bible and praying and meeting with him, or do I hit snooze two, three times and spend extra time in my bed? The point is simple, but the point is this. When I obey God, my shield is up. When I trust God, my shield is up. But when I disobey, I'm believing the enemy, and I'm dropping my shield. So the first thing we got to remember is that God is better than sin. Here's point number two. God is bigger. Turn to your neighbor and say, God is bigger. And here's what I mean. God is bigger than your trials. 
Now, I don't know what you're exactly experiencing. It could be an injury. It could be disease. There could be relational tension or friction. It could be a mental health struggle. It could be financial. It could have something to do with your family or your children. But remember, Paul says these are like fiery darts. They're fiery. They're hot. They're scary. They're anxiety-inducing, but they're small compared to the shield that is the shape of a door. In fact, elsewhere in Scripture, it says that whatever we face in this life is light, momentary affliction when we compare it to the eternal weight of God. It's a dart, but compare it to the shield. This is another story of a missionary. This man's name was John Patton. John Patton was actually a missionary in, in, uh, to South Sea Islanders. Now, you want to talk about a tough group to do ministry with? This was a tribe that was known for cannibalism, okay? And so they did not have the Bible translated in their language. So John Patton every day would set, to trans- would set himself to translate the New Testament into their language. And so one day he was actually working in his study. And one of the natives actually bust into his door, might have been a college student, you know, and he just like lays himself on the chair. So he's chilling, he's relaxing. John Patton's trying to translate the New Testament. And this native looks at this missionary and he says, it is so good to rest my entire weight on this chair. And this came at the perfect moment because John Patton was struggling with his translation because what he realized is that there was no word for trust, believe, or faith in the South Sea language. But in that moment, it came to him. He says this, I had my word. I realized that what faith was, it was resting your entire weight on God. So this is what Patton did. He translated the whole New Testament. He actually leads an entire tribe of cannibals to faith. But this is what it means to hold on to the shield of faith. I place my whole weight on God. So whenever I'm tempted, I remember that God is better. Whenever I'm being tested by trials and adversity, I remember that God is bigger. And I know the fiery darts, they feel hot, but we got to focus on God, our shield, in the midst of trials. So when you see this, we got to remember that God is better, God is bigger. Number three, y'all ready for this? God uses the heat. Can you say to your neighbor, God uses the heat? Because you might be thinking to yourself, you're like, Ben, you know, I'm tracking with you that God is a shield. But you're, are you like even a real pastor? Do you even know my life? Because if God's really surrounding me and protecting me and defending me, my life sure doesn't feel safe. Do you know what happened to my family member? It doesn't seem like God was protecting me here. Do you know what I've gone through? I don't feel defended. And here's what I would lay before you. Because if you are suffering, and there's many in this room that are, would you just consider this? That God could be using this small suffering to shield you from a greater suffering. That God could be using a smaller suffering to shield you from a greater suffering. See, God uses heat. God allows hardship and adversity and pain to protect us from something worse. And ultimately, that's hell. But here's God's design, his intent, his purpose with the heat, the adversity of life, that it would force us to run to him as our shield. Let me give you a couple examples. Let's go to the next slide. We've got three pictures right here. Got a T-bone steak. We've got some ore. You know, this is some, uh, like a mineral. It's got some gold mixed in. And then we've got a very uh, selfish, pouty child. Okay? That's nobody's kid. That's, uh, you know, just a standard graphic from Google. But here's what I want you to think about, okay? You ever been to a nice steakhouse? And, you know, everything's a la carte. There's no combo meals. And usually before you make your order, they wheel out the cart of meat, and they hold up. Here's the tomahawk chop. Here's the New York strip. Here's the filet mignon. And, and here's what we know about good red meat, okay, is that, it, that, that steak needs the right amount of heat to become delicious. You with me? Now think about the gold ore right here. It needs the right amount of refining or purifying fire to become gold. Think about this child right here. Two weeks ago in this very room, we had a parenting conference, and we learned the benefits of, you know, positive affirmation and encouragement, and I'm on board with those things, okay? But even our children need the right amount of heat 
that's discipline, that's instruction, that's boundaries, if they're going to become a responsible adult. You tracking with me? So just think about this. Left alone, when these things are raw, steak is inedible, ore is worthless, and children remain immature. But when heat is introduced, the steak becomes delicious, a beautiful medium rare. The gold becomes jewelry. It's valuable, and the child becomes a responsible adult. And so here's the point. Do you understand what the job of you know, the barbecue pit master or the chef, the jeweler or the parent, is their job, their responsibility is to apply the perfect amount of heat, the proper amount of heat to the relationship, because too little, that item would be unusable. Too much heat, it becomes consumed. They need to introduce the right amount of heat So these things are transformed and refined. So here's the truth about adversity and heat in our lives. It'll either make you a far better or a far worse Christian, but you won't stay the same. So here's my question for you. Do you trust God that he is introducing just the right amount of heat, like a divine chef, a divine jeweler, a perfect parent, because he wants to make you useful and beautiful? That's how God uses heat. Let's look at one more point. One more point is this. If we're going to hold the shield, we've got to remember that God took the hit. Can you turn to your partner right now and just say, God took the hit? I know this seems really basic. We've tried to describe the shield. The shield is comprised of wood, metal, even like, like this leather that is actually oiled to extinguish the flames uh, of the darts. This is a pretty simple point, but just stop for a moment and ponder, like, how does a shield work? I, I know it's just a door, okay, but, but how does it work? What a shield literally is, it's the go-between. It absorbs the blow. It extinguishes the, the flame by taking it in and consuming it. So the point is this, is that Jesus is our shield. Do you see this? On the cross, Jesus had his hand on the wall. And Satan gave Jesus everything he had. Satan was desperate. And yet Jesus took the hit and he shielded us from greater harm. Now remember this, in the ancient Near East, the Jews, they were waiting for a savior. They they, they wanted a hero, but they thought he was going to be a soldier. Did they not? They thought he was going to be maybe a general or a commander and someone who would vanquish the Romans. And then Jesus shows up on the scene. Not to bear the sword, but he receives the judgment of the sword. Jesus didn't come with a sword in hand, yet what did he have in his hands? Nail-scarred hands. Jesus overcomes evil with good. He gave himself up. He absorbs the blow. And it wasn't just flaming darts, but the very fire of hell. And this is how Christ extinguishes the flame of the evil one. Because on, in that moment, on the cross, Jesus lost the cover of the Father. He lost his safety. He lost his protection. This is why he cries out, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's saying, God, you've abandoned me. You've removed the shield. And I'm taking the fire upon myself. But because Jesus cries out, my God, why have you forsaken me? Just like David, we can exclaim, the Lord is my strength. The Lord is my shield. So brothers and sisters, if Jesus has taken on your suffering, why would, he, why would he ignore your suffering now? This brings us to our last point. This is where we'll wrap up. So here's the question. Where are we taking our shields? In other words, what direction are we moving? Now remember, the shield was used in a critical point in every battle. When we got our foot on the enemy, when he's about to tap out, when we're at the wall, on the verge of conquering. In fact, when these Roman soldiers would fight, they wouldn't just hold the shield in isolation. They would actually be uh, shoulder to shoulder, almost like in a platoon or a brigade. They called this a a phalanx. Let's go to the next slide. This is what it would actually look like. Uh, Let's go to the next one. There you go. It would look like a phalanx. And this is why we need other believers. We need the church so we can actually form a wall of protection. And we can strengthen each other's faith. But just think about this for a moment. The shield is a defensive weapon, but we're actually playing offense. Are you tracking? 
And, and I realize that you guys listen to podcasts and you read the blogs and you watch cable news and everybody's talking about the de-church movement and the rise of secularism and how most people in this next generation identify as non-religious. But we are not taking up our shields to retreat, to run away, to withdraw so we can hold up in a fortress and just wait for Jesus to return. Remember, we're at the wall. And the only time we take up a shield is when we're attacking. And so this is really important for two types of people in the room. Some of you have gotten way too comfortable in the battle. You might be thinking to yourself, well, Ben, I'm not feeling a whole lot of darts. I'm not getting attacked. Maybe it's because you're away from the front lines. So the point is this. You don't need protection when you're a mile away from the wall. When you're chilling, distracted, disobedient, locked in on your phone, embracing comfort. For some of you, the reason why you're not being attacked is because the enemy doesn't respect you as an adversary. Others of you are brand new Christians or maybe you're making decisions to be serious disciples of Jesus. And just know this, the moment you make a decision to battle evil in your life, to battle evil in your family, in your workplace, in your city, you need to expect fiery darts. This seems a little counterintuitive. Some of you are like, Ben, I just decided to follow Jesus and my life seems harder than it's ever been. It's because the enemy thinks you're dangerous. Let me give you one more cheesy story. Uh, up until a couple of years ago, I still played intramural sports, you know, at West Georgia. I was like the old middle-aged white guy just trying not to get hurt, Okay. And so we played pickup basketball, and what I would do is I, I'm, a, I'm a lot better at assembling a team than, like, playing on the team, so I would get a bunch of football players on my team, okay? So I'm talking, like, guys who are all, like, 6'4", could jump out the gym, like, dunk basketballs, and then there was me, okay? And we'd always go up, like, 20 on these other teams, so I was, like, the 11th man on the bench. I'd get in there. They'd pass me the ball, and whoever was defending me, they would, like, see the other guys on my team and then look at me, and they would give me, like, six feet of space, just whatever, because there was no respect, and I didn't earn the respect. Well, we actually hit one game, and one guy on the team was like, Ben, you, you really don't shoot a lot, and you really don't score a lot. I'm like, because you're a lot better than me. And they said, Ben, today we all talked about it. We want you to score 10 points this game. I was like, guys, we might not win this one, but I'll give it my best shot. Yeah, I'm a team guy. So, so they passed me the ball. As luck would have it, I put up a little shot, and it goes in, okay? And then somehow I poke a ball out, take it coast to coast. I get a little layup. Next time we know, I get the ball, and the defender is not six feet away. Guess what? He's about six inches away, okay? He's in my grill. He's like on me like white on rice. I can smell him because he respects my game, okay? Whether I earned it or not, okay? Does the enemy respect your game? If you're a new Christian, if you're a new disciple, when you get serious about following Jesus, oftentimes your life gets harder. So when you commit to obeying God or being serious about evangelism or making disciples, you, when you align your life with the Great Commission, you'll experience what Paul did in Romans 7. Paul says this, when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. It's all up in my grill. One last verse. Because Jesus says this, he echoes the same sentiment. He reminds his disciples, he says this, I'm going to build my church. You see what he's saying? He's saying, we're playing offense. We're on the attack. And he says this, the gates of hell will not prevail. Talk about a pregame speech right there. That'll get you fired up. Reminds me of another bridge. Anybody ever been to the Golden Gate Bridge? Okay. From what I understand, it is the longest and tallest suspension bridge in the world. It's over one mile long. Believe it or not, it's not actually gold, okay? Who knew? Uh, but they built it in the 1930s, and it was extremely dangerous, okay? Because think about it. If you were a worker, a bridge builder, you would have to get on some sort of scaffolding, some sort of suspension, and if there was a strong gust of wind, it could knock you off the bridge and you would fall to your death. And this was, a, this was actually a serious problem when they were constructing the Golden Gate Bridge. 35 men fell, and 11 of them died. And so the whole workforce was terrified. They'd show up to work every day, this big daunting project, thinking this might be my last day of work because I might fall to my death. The foreman, the boss, was getting anxious as well, okay, thinking like a foreman. He's like, we're going to miss our deadline. We're going to be over budget. 
My workforce is terrified they might even die. And so he came up with an ingenious solution. Does anybody know what he did? He actually built a safety net. He built a safety net. And they were able to complete the bridge in two years under budget and before the deadline. When's the last time that happened with a construction project? And 19 men, after they erected the safety net, fell, and instead of dying, they survived. Here's the point. Here's what we learned from the Golden Gate Bridge. If you're going to devote your life to building a bridge, you need a safety net. Well, brothers and sisters, if you're going to devote your life to building disciples and building the church, you need a shield. Because both tasks are dangerous, they're risky, they're anxiety-inducing, and just like Paul, we desire to boldly proclaim the gospel. So what do you and I need? We need a covering. We need protection so that we can focus on success rather than survival. Well, here's where the story gets even better. I told you that 19 men fell and survived. Do you know this? They actually started a club, like a little fraternity. And you know, like frat guys did, they met at a bar, they get some beer, and they tell stories about how they experienced the saving power of the net. Like any good club, they had a name. They were called the Halfway to Hell Club. I think you were to see where the story is going. Well, brothers and sisters, you know what we are? We're a club. And we don't meet in a pub. We meet in this church every Sunday. And here's the story that we recount, that we exhort, that we celebrate, is that is that Jesus didn't descend halfway into hell. He experienced hell on our behalf. He saved our life. He is our safety net. He is our shield. Do you see that? When, When we share, when we sing, when we celebrate, when we pray, it inspires us. It motivates us. So what if you took up your shield? What if you pushed back evil in your life, in your job, in your neighborhood, in your city? What if men and women in this room formed a phalanx, shoulder to shoulder, side by side, and defended each other from the lies of the enemy? Do you know this? In Revelation 3, the last words that God speaks to his exact church in Ephesus is this, to the one who conquers. Do you see what God is saying to this church? He's saying, you got your foot on the enemy. You are at the wall, and he says the same thing to the men and women of King's Chapel. Brothers and sisters, if Jesus is our shield, if we've taken up the shield, if we've held on to Jesus, we will deal evil a decisive blow. So today, will you take up your shield? Next week, will you take up your sword? And will you join us and fight the good fight? Let me pray. Jesus, you tell us, in this life we will face tribulation, but take heart, you have overcome the world. God, there's just a reality. Life is hard, there's fiery darts, there is a war going on around us. For the men and, this women, men and women in this room who are not acquainted with the hardship of battle, will you open our eyes? Will you move us towards the front lines? Will we pick up our shield? Will we pick up our sword? For those of us who are fighting, Lord, I pray that we would lock arms with our brothers and sisters in this room, that we would hold the shield together, that we would push back evil, we would defend ourselves from the lies of the enemy. Lord, in this city, will we deal evil and wickedness a decisive blow? But Jesus, you are our shield. You extinguished hell. You absorbed the blow. You took the hit. Lord, may we, may we be men and women who conquer and fight and battle to the power that you give us. We pray in your name. Amen.